do another morning. Um, a parks world of psychology, I promised you that you would be on the wiki, and I took five minutes this morning before or after breakfast to do it. This is my wiki, and I've had it for a couple years now, and I've used it in a couple different ways, and I'm not going to spend time on it. Um, but if you go to getsite.wikispaces.com, you can get on my wiki, no problem. If you, were, if you want to join the wiki, you can. You don't have to. We test it out to make sure that even though you know, if you're not joining it, you just have to click on things that will open. And as you can see, a couple, a month or so ago, I actually updated the first page of my wiki, and guess who's on the front there? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so anything that you see on the wiki, like there's certain, you know, anything that's underlined like this is a link. So if you wanted to, for example, open that up, you would see the infamous name of Myers, who is the best book author of the world for Insurance Psych, and the most wonderful man I've ever met. And he worked with us on the Standards Revision Committee, so he's one of the experts that worked with us when we wrote and revised the standards. And he's still, he is just a friend of psychology, as it is Dr. Burrell, and will forever, ever, be someone that you want to be devoted to. In fact, he has donated money to APS for workshops for teachers, so you know that. Okay, um, so that's you know just a little example of how you open up a link. What I already put on here, which really is just was it? There is the Clark High School Teachers link I promised I would put on. You can peruse this on your own, but when you click on the left there on the link, there is uh, three of the things I already told you that I would put on three, my scientific inquiry domain, all those links that you wanted. That mm -hmm. document is a Word doc. You can open these up and save them on your computer. The biosite thing I did is on there. The, um, the second thing I did that had the essential questions and that kind of stuff related to teaching and some ideas um, is on there. And I will put this presentation on there as well for developmental. And also we can put anything you want on here. So for example, I took the liberty of putting some of your pictures that I already took on here. Um, and hopefully we'll add some more so that you'll have some good memories in picture form of what we did. Okay. If you would like to add anything to the wiki, you can, so you can play with that at home and, and see that you can actually, you can't edit it, but there's discussion prompts and stuff that I, um, you can look at, and you can like write things and add things on your own if you want. And you can send a link through a discussion that everybody can see and open up. If you, can, if you want to send me a link, I'll put it on here, whatever you want. But at least it's a place you can go, like I promised, to get stuff, okay? And I'll, I'll add more to it, no problem. Um, in fact, there's some things on here, like when I talk tomorrow about um, the science and, and history of happiness and the research being done by psychologists today, there's actually some links already on here related to that, um, and some other stuff that if you know, you're interested in. Okay. But anyway, it's there for you. Okay. Also, when Nancy was talking today, um, again, my brain was going crazy um, relating to things that you know, I would love to talk about and don't have a lot of time. Um, even though I'm going to discuss development, specifically in that domain, uh, lifespan development today, I am going to talk about um, only one of these seven units that you teach, correct? Just as a quick little survey here, when you look at the methods and issues and the theories of lifespan development, and you look at the stages of development, three, four, five, six, and seven. How many of you believe that you spend most of your time on three, four, five, and six? Raise your hand. Think about your unit. You spend most of your unit discussing stages three, four, five, and six. For good reason, right? Why? Why do you think you spend more time on those units? all the different theories, all the different stages within the theories, you can just go for days. There is so much information that you don't want to leave anything out, right, Jill? They, they can relate to it. Uh, they're, they're adolescents? No. Yes. They Sometimes they're still kids. kids too. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and so when you're doing your lifespan development unit and you're tracing development, you can have them relate to every aspect of this development as you go through each stage and you discuss cognitive and social and emotional and sociocultural and physical and motor development and they're like, 
Yeah, I remember when I was trying to learn to ride a bike and fell on my butt and broke my leg. I mean, they, you know, they've got all these awesome personal experiences to share with you, and it makes life very interesting. So you don't have to come up with your own examples, right? Which is nice for change. And also, it's relatable. So it goes back to how you know, they're going to be actively involved in your lessons because of that. However, it is very important to teach adulthood and aging. You don't want to not teach it. So, I'm actually focusing my workshop lesson today on that stage, number seven. Not that there's not a lot of great stuff that I could talk about on the others, but I think that there are some things that I'd like to pull in today specifically related to how you use real research in your classes to teach about developmental psychology. And the real research that I decided to use with my human developing class last semester at college was the research I'm going to share with you today, which I also used in the intro to psych class with freshmen. I had intro to psych freshmen, and I had in my human development class mostly nurses who were going back to get their nursing degree, and they had to take this course that was required by the university to get their VA in nursing. So it works at any level. I'm sure it works at the high school level, no doubt in my mind. Because it's readable, it's the right level of reading, um, it allows for a body weight discussion, and the kids will learn so much about research methods that this is a great example again of how I said you need to teach research methods throughout the course. So I, I chose research methods to teach about adulthood and aging, and I'm going to show that with you, okay? Also, some of this stuff is in your binder, and you may have trouble finding it, so don't even worry about looking for it, but um, there are some examples of some of the things I'm going to talk about already in your binder, and um, I'm going to also give out a few other things that I might actually, I hope, have time for you to do an activity with, a couple activities that relate to this chapter, one of which I actually did with my students in the classroom. Um, also, you've got materials from APA that I asked for specifically on aging. This is from the American Psychological Association. Um, they produce all kinds of great materials, and I have a couple links on the PowerPoint to show you also websites where you can go to get information from them. Um, there's Division 12, the Clinical Geropsychology uh, Gero Division, which, you know, if kids are looking for careers and jobs and working with individuals in aging, there's a lot of great materials on APA websites for careers related to aging. So, you know, great pamphlet and, you know, some of these things you can download and print yourself. Some of them you can also get hard copies of, which you did if you want it for your classroom. So, you know, there's a lot of great resources available for you. Okay? Okay, so looking to get into content standards, I have to do that. That's the way I work. Um, these are three standards that relate to, or three of the performance standards that relate to adulthood and aging. We want them to be able to identify major physical changes associated with adulthood and aging, which we've done with all the stages prior to this, right? We've done that. Describe cognitive changes in adulthood and aging. They've already done cognitive changes from infancy to adolescence and early adulthood, correct? And discuss social, cultural, and emotional issues in aging. Again. We have taught them this prior to this stage, so they already understand a lot of the theory <coughs> behind this. And now they should continue. They should continue to be able to say, here's where I am, because they're adolescents, right? They're probably here somewhere, right? And they're eventually going to become, and they are becoming young adults. And what's going to happen to them as they age? I think it's very important that they learn that. And that's what I really want to be a focus of this part of my lesson. So, if I'm looking at um, essential questions, which I earlier mentioned, how is development a continuous process from conception to death? Is that a good essential question for your unit? And applies to any stage you're talking about. It's a big question with many answers, right? Um, does human development occur gradually or in stages? How many of you have that discussion with your students from day one? Right? You talk about how things happen in stages, but that, you know, they're not necessarily overnight. And there's this garage. So that's nothing new. Everybody starts with that, actually, when you talk about in the very first day of the chapter, I think. Do people change over the lifespan, or are they relatively stable? Have you asked the questions to your students about that? Do you think you're the same person you were when you were 20, Mike? Do you think um, you've changed much emotionally since you were um, 25? Your students, you know? 
When you were 10, were you, were you the same giddy kid that you are today? You know, and the kid's like, yep, I was. <laughs> Some of them will say, no, I was shy and I am now outgoing. So what made you change? These are issues that you want to explore at any stage of your development in your life. Are there critical periods? You were mentioning the word critical period this morning with language, and of course we have to make sure that the kids understand the difference, and there is a difference, between critical and sensitive periods, and how that applies to development. And so, you know, there are some things that are sensitive periods at certain stages of life where things should happen, because they'll happen the best, but they're not critical. They don't have to happen at that stage in life. And that's a really good discussion to have when you're talking about aging. Also, how does heredity interact with the environment? So, you know, the nature-nurture interaction, I never say versus. I try not to use that anymore. You know, it used to be H versus E. No, it's interaction. The arrows go both ways. Um, that's really an important concept in aging as well. So, the essential questions related to this unit, um, if there are more, we must bring in the cultural aspect. They have to understand gender. They have to understand socio-cultural economic issues that relate to aging, do they not? Keep those in mind as very important questions that you might ask your students so that they can become enduring understandings when they leave your room and go out into the other world. Not really. Okay? So, Again, look at the themes on the APA website, which relate to the standards. I already pointed them out, and you can see some of these things, and they, they actually all relate to your unit on development. This is the website from the APA on aging, some of the resources I earlier showed you, so you can find that link when you get this PowerPoint and open it up. Uh, there's a life plan for the lifespan, APA Committee on Aging. This brochure was initially developed for a psychologist by the two, uh, 2005 APA Committee on Aging, we call CONA. And this is a wonderful um, resource. So that, you know, when you click this, right here, this will take you to the website where you can, again, see brochures and resource guides and other materials available to you that you'll be able to use with your kids. There's fact sheets down here, the PDF files, you can open up, save them, use them in your classroom on many different topics like coping with stress and anxiety, memory and aging. In fact, I think I put the memory and aging one in your folder already, so you can see it's like a PowerPoint. All right, so there's a lot of materials in there. Um, this is what I want to focus on today. How many of you have ever heard of the Midas study? Really honestly heard of it? I'm not surprised, I never heard of it until about three years ago. And it was actually, what, 1985 when they started it, I think? So anyway, we're going to talk about that today and how we can use this in our classroom. Now, I did put a summary of the Midas study in your book. I don't know if you'll be able to find it. It's called Midlife in the United States, a National Study of Health and Well-Being. So the summary pages that download right from the internet are in your book. Um, but very quickly, um, when you look at this study, what this is all about, it's a, it's a longitudinal study, okay? And this longitudinal study is something that I believe that will help you teach your students about adulthood and aging in their world using the real research of psychologists. It was 1995-96 that it was um, conducted, the Midlife Development in the United States, that's what it stands for. And it's really a great example of research to share with your kids. It's a multidisciplinary team of scholars from psychology, sociology, I can't say this word. Yes, epidemiology. Epidemiology. Thank you, epidemiology. My brain is tired. <laughs> Demography, anthropology, medicine, healthcare policy, and they wanted to investigate the role of behavioral, psychological, and social factors in accounting for age-related variations in health and well-being in a national sample of Americans. So I'm like, all right, this is perfect for teaching about adulthood and aging stages in my class. Um, so it's a longitudinal study. And what's wonderful about it is that you can see how this information is used to um, develop all kinds of um, resources for the public, as well as resources that you can use as teachers. 
Okay? Alright, so when you go to this website, one of the things that I used in my classroom, besides the actual information about the study, which this is the main page of the study, and when you go here about the study, you'll get that information that I actually just read to you briefly. It's a nice summary of the actual study and how it was conducted. But what I really liked about this, um, besides for researchers, there's a link for researchers that explains how this study was done in 1995, and that's actually MIDAS-1. And then um, more research was added. The second MIDAS study was conducted in 2002-2006 to further study these changes in the, in the longitudinal lives of the individuals. And there's a third one that's ready to come out in 2013, I think. They're going to conduct more research. So, you know, here's a real-life research study that you can bring into the classroom and have your students read about, analyze, discuss, and learn about adulthood and aging rather than just using your textbook and just using um, notes and lectures and a few little activities here and there. Okay? So how could you possibly use this? And how could you make it so that um, the, the kids would be interested in it? Um, what are, what's available to you as a teacher that you can use off this website? So here's one thing I did. We don't have a lot of time. I decided that there were these awesome newsletters on the website. First of all, there's the Midas Overview. So I downloaded the Midas Overview, which I put in your books. And I did a cooperative learning exercise with this. I divided up my class into groups. Today I'm only going to divide up into two groups at the same time. But if there's 30 kids in the class, then, you know, 4 into 30, if possible, no more than 4 kids in the group. You know, it depends on how many kids you have. I said, okay, one group is going to read the Midas Overview, which is only four pages long, so most of them can read it in about 10 minutes. They'll highlight the main ideas of the Midas Overview. This is in your folder. You know. They'll, as a group, discuss it and they'll come up with five or six very important points that they want to share with the rest of the class. And they'll be the first group to present about what the MITRE study is all about. So they'll look at the research study itself, how the samples were collected, the content of the study. They'll be talking about how it was a survey, how it looked at socio-demographic factors, genetic factors, life challenges, health behaviors. They're going to summarize those key points of the study for everyone <coughs> in the class. The second group is then going to probably look at the long reach of childhood experiences. I put that in your book as well. So that small group will read that newsletter and again, summarize the main ideas that were found about how childhood influences your education. <coughs> Isn't that something you talked about in your classes? What are your childhood experiences and how they influence you as an adult? Yeah. It focuses on the findings related to mental and physical <coughs> health in adulthood. Again, reviewing some of the findings from this research study. So they'll do the same thing. They'll read it in their group, they'll discuss it, they'll come up with main ideas, and they'll move that into the rest of the class. That'll be the second group. Then you pick and choose. I like the stressor one. Daily stress, how does it affect our health and well-being? Because we know it does. So, you know, the, the children read that, and that group takes care of that one. Let's see, what else? Um, Cognitive abilities, that's a good one. We teach cognitive development in all our stages, so one group does that one. So depending on how many groups you have in your class, you could do one, two, three, four, five, six of these, right? So that's one whole class period, is it not? You've introduced it, you have explained what the study is all about briefly, because one group is going to exchange, I'm mean, actually explaining in more detail with the intro newsletter. So maybe you spend one class period, and for me that was 45 minutes, of the children reading the newsletter, highlighting the main ideas, and coming up with what they're going to share with the class. So day two, you begin the process of sharing, right? Like the jigsaw activity. And then you, each group only needs five minutes to share what they learned. You're not talking an hour in presentation. So five, six, seven minutes. Group one, group two, group three. So again, that might take a whole period, right? For every group to share. Then what might you do with it? What would you do the third day? Ideas? I'd have to move on. To what? Sorry, to something else. What do you mean to something else? 
um, to my next topic because I have 20 weeks. Okay. This is great. What would be your next it. topic that might fit into the curriculum that you have to teach about adulthood and aging? Let me think about that. Okay. What else could you do? The next step. Death and dying. Death and dying. Okay. Very good. You might move on to some other issues related to adulthood and aging that you really should talk about, like death and dying. And we tend to avoid that. <laughs> you should talk about it. I so, was um, Tuesdays with Lori. Oh, excellent. And I did the last one. Yes. And the college professor that did his last lecture, what's his name? Okay, you have to see that. So we'll put that on the link on the wiki. Somebody write it down for me, okay? <laughs> um, that's amazing for discussing death and dying because it's so positive. Okay, any other ideas? Well, I think before you move on, even if it's just a few minutes, you need to have some sort of personal reflection because when they come out of groups, they really need the, the personal responsibility of reflecting on their own. So maybe a journal um, Good. entry, maybe a, um, a ticket out or whatever. Good. I think that's a great idea. You can come up with tons of things you can do as a check for understanding to see what they learned. You can come up with a journal reflection, which also can be a check for understanding, and it certainly is a great example of assessment because we're asking, you know, do you need assessment? You absolutely need assessment. Because assessment helps the kids learn. Assessment's not a test at the end of the chapter for a grade. Especially coming out of a group activity yeah. and individual accountability. Absolutely. So you also want some individual accountability. Because when you're doing group work, you know that it doesn't work if you only give a group grade. We need to have individual grades as well. So if there's a group grade, then you need to have an individual grade. That counts at least a quarter. Because there's four in a group. Say many. So maybe you know, a quarter of the total presentation. So you can come up with some creative ways to grade, and we can spend hours discussing that. Any other ideas? Um, I'd write a letter to my 80-year-old self <laughs> <laughs> and tell that 80-year-old exactly what to do so that when you get there, you What learn. you learned and what you want to remember when you're that age about what you learned. Uh, some of you may actually write letters, have your kids write letters to themselves. I know we have grade school teachers that have the children write letters to themselves and mail them to our students when they are graduating high school. It's wonderful. The kids get that letter from their fourth grade teacher and they're like, oh, she remembered. You know, that's the whole purpose of the assignment. Not actually, she, you know, it, it's so helpful. And if you use those letters in the classroom that the fourth grade teacher wrote about the kid, when you're discussing child development in your psych class, how cool is that? Really cool. Yes, cool. I'm not sure this would work, but to relate it, um, could they have an audience that's other than themselves? Thank that you. is to say, could they consider two different ways to run with this? One, to think of contacting some kind of aging community yes. that might benefit from the knowledge, or, for example, on the Midas group, Margie Lackman, who's one of the researchers, um, she's just a wonderful teacher. She teaches at Brandeis, her daughter's a Clark alum, mm -hmm. like Dr. Gurel. Um, and you know, I wonder if the students were to send it off to somebody like her, or one of the researchers for whom there are links there, and say, you may be too busy, but could one of your students look over what we wrote and Excellent. provide some feedback? Excellent idea. Along the same lines, uh, probably every one of my students would have an elderly relative. All right. you, could, you could use the knowledge created in the uh, activity and have them do an interview, maybe a video or um, interview. And awesome. ask some questions and yes, you know, interview do them. Some research. Take questions out of the research and ask them the same questions. Right. Wow, that's perfect, isn't it, Jerry? Uh, a lot of places have adult daycare centers, yes. and some of the students they have their grandparents living with them, but then during the day they yes. might have these other activities, and when they go, they just don't sit there and watch TV. The activities are related to where they are. And you can always bring your students to the local nursing home or um, you know other areas that they can work with them. I brought my students to the nursing home in the district, um, and we had an activity day there. And it was phenomenal. I mean, the kids were doing karaoke, and believe me, the adults mm -hmm. were singing much better than the kids mm -hmm. at the nursing home, you know, doing karaoke, they were doing puzzles with them, they were taking walks with them. The nursing home has animals there, pets, you know, they had dogs and cats. So the kids already knew about the importance of the animals in people's lives and how it's very related to stress and, and health as you get older. So 
they were experiencing a lot of the stuff at the nursing home that we had talked about in class. Even if it was the only one day discussion in class, that one day at the nursing home just added to what they learned in like, it just multiplied it by, I don't know how much, I can't even tell you. Because it was seeing what we discussed, seeing what they read about in the research studies. So that's a great way of adding in a service learning activity for your students to, to experience this. You know, some kids don't have grandparents, and some kids live with their grandparents. So you've got a wide range of kids in your room that um, have different experiences that they're going to want to share. And the other students, of course, can learn from this. So I love all your ideas, and of course, we could come up with a hundred more. And that's the whole point of this. I want you to think of how you could use this in your classroom and not just take what I said I did and use it. Because there's a lot of ways you can go with it, okay? Um, what you mentioned, Nancy, in a way is kind of like what I wanted the kids to do um, when I first came up with this idea. I said, I want you to develop a presentation. This is an authentic assessment. A presentation on what you learned that you can use, not just in my classroom, where you can present this information to adults to help them understand the aging process. What might you recommend to your students? Where could they present? Right in their, their parents and what their parents assess. They could do that at home. How about a bigger audience? Faculty. The faculty of your school. The PTA, parents organizations. On, on back to school night, my students had all these, you know, books that they got, the free thing on how to get your memory increasing them. They were giving them out to the parents, it was hysterical. From the Dana Foundation, you know, stress and aging, memory and aging, they're like, would you like a pamphlet, would you like a pamphlet? And the, and the parents were like, are you, are you trying to tell me something now? But they made up these little books themselves as well. They made up little pamphlets and summarized some things they learned, and they had a table in the back to school night area. We have a big, um, we have a cafeteria on back to school night, so we have tables. Every department has a table set up. And we have ideas and examples of things our students do in our classes on the tables. So to have your students man the tables and pass out stuff that they did in psychology, it's really cool advertisement. And the parents love it. And I was like, wow, look what they did, you know? Pamphlets they made up and stuff. And it's a way for them to share what they learned with the adults. So that's another great way to spread some of this information around. And I'm sure there's others, okay? Oh, that's the website. Uh, hold on. Can you close the website? Oh, that's the website. I'm trying to click the PowerPoint. Okay, so the newsletters provide summaries, and then your students can add to that what they've learned and provide things in other forms. So lots and lots of great information from the Midas study. There's also NPR News. You can always go to these links, and you can um, listen to podcasts related to many different topics. This one happens to be called Protecting Mental Strengths Through Middle Age. Um, multiple related studies and research have spun off from the Midas study. And so there are other groups all over the country that are doing um, research related to aging. So this is a nice little podcast that you can listen to. Um, I already said how there's Midas 1, 2, and 3. So yeah, it is 2013 that the data collection is scheduled to begin to continue this longitudinal study. So what a great thing to use in teaching about research. You could talk about this the first chapter in your book. Or you could wait to talk about it during development, right? Or you could use it both if you like. Actually, to be honest with you, forget what this link is. <laughs> oh, that's the article. That's the article in the New York Times. Was, yes. Yeah. And it it's actually came article. up no problem for me and I read it. So I'll have to play with that one. I'm not sure why it didn't come up. But that's the link in the New York Times. like 20 hours at one. Oh, great. Alright, so you ready for a TED Talk? Mm -hmm. You gotta watch this one. Okay, and this is Dan Butler. This is some Buechner. This is something I you have to show your students in class. Well you don't have to, but I recommend you do it. It's not that long and they will learn so much from it. Have you ever heard of blue zones? Okay. As it says here, teams of scientists have been studying blue zones. 
to try to figure out why some people live so much longer than others, in a nutshell. So let's watch them him talk about this research. And think, how would you use this in your classroom? Something called the Danish Twin Study established that only about 10% of how long the average person lives within certain biological limits is dictated by our genes. The other 90% is dictated by our lifestyle. So the premise of Blue Zone is if we can find the optimal lifestyle of longevity, we can come up with a de facto formula for longevity. But if you ask the average American what the optimal formula of longevity is, they probably couldn't tell you. They've probably heard of the South Beach diet or the Atkins diet, and you have the USDA food pyramid. There's what Oprah tells us. There's what Dr. Oz tells us. The fact of the matter is there's a lot of confusion around what really helps us live longer better. Should you be running marathons or doing yoga? Should you eat organic meats or should you be eating tofu? When it comes to supplements, should you be taking them? Uh, how about these hormones or resveratrol? And does purpose play into it? Spirituality, and how about how we socialize? Well, our approach to finding longevity was to team up with National Geographic and the National Institute on Aging to find the four demographically confirmed areas that are geographically defined, and then bring a team of experts in there to methodically go through exactly what these people do to, to distill down the cross-cultural distillation. And at the end of this, I'm gonna tell you what that distillation is, but first, I'd like to debunk some common myths when it comes to longevity. And the first myth is if you try really hard, you can live to be 100. False. The problem is only about one out of 5,000 people in America are, live to be 100. Your, your chances are, are very low. Even though it's the fastest growing demographic in America, it's hard to reach 100. The problem is that we are not programmed for longevity. We are programmed for something called procreative success. I love that word. It reminds me of my college days. <laughs> Biologists term procreative success to, to mean the age where you have children and then another generation, the age when your children have children. After that, the effect of evolution completely dissipates. If you're a mammal, uh, if you're a, a rat or an elephant or a human be in between, uh, it's the same story. So to make it to age 100, you not only have to have had a very good lifestyle, you also have to have won the genetic lottery. The second myth is there are treatments that can help slow, reverse, or even stop aging. False. When you think of it, there's 99 things that can age us. Deprive your brain of oxygen for just a few minutes, those brain cells die, they never come back. Play tennis too hard on your knees, ruin your cartilage, that cartilage never comes back. Our arteries can clog, our brains can gunk up with plaque and we can get Alzheimer's. There's just too many things to go wrong. Our bodies have 35 trillion cells. Trillion with the T, we're talking national debt numbers here. <laughs> Those cells turn themselves over once every eight years and every time they turn themselves over, there's some damage and that damage builds up, and it builds up exponentially. It's a little bit like the days when we all had uh, Beatles albums or Eagles albums, and we'd make a copy of that on a cassette tape and then let our friends copy that cassette tape, and pretty soon, with successive generations, that tape sounds like garbage. Well, the same things happen to our cells. That's why a 65-year-old person is aging at a rate of about 125 times faster than a 12-year-old person. So if there's nothing you can do to slow your aging or stop your aging, what am I doing here? Well, the fact of the matter is the best science tells us that the capacity of the human body, my body, your body, is about 90 years, a little bit more for well, women. But life expectancy in this country is only 78. So somewhere along the line, we're leaving about 12 good years on the table. These are years that 
um, we could get. And they, uh, research shows that they, could, they, that they would be years largely free of chronic disease, heart, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. We think uh, the best way to get these missing years is to look at the cultures around the world that are actually experiencing them. Areas where people are living to age 100 at rates up to 10 times greater than we are, areas where the life expectancy is an extra dozen years, and the rate of middle age mortality is a fraction of what it is in this country. We found our first blue zone about 125 miles off the coast of Italy on the island of Sardinia, and not the entire island. The island's about 1.4 million people, but only up in the highlands, an area called the Noro province. And here we have this area where men live the longest, about 10 times more centenarians than we have here in America. And this is a place where people not only reach age 100, they do so with extraordinary vigor places where 102-year-olds still ride their bike to work, chop wood, and can <laughs> beat a guy 60 years younger than them. <laughs> their history actually goes back to about the time of Christ. It's actually a Bronze Age culture that's been isolated. Because the land is so infertile, they're largely uh, shepherds, which occasions regular low-intensity physical activity. Their diet is mostly plant-based, accentuated with foods that they can carry into the fields. They came up with an unleavened whole wheat, bread uh, called nota musica, made out of durum wheat, a type of cheese made from grass-fed um, animals. So it's hot, the cheese is high in omega-3 fatty acids instead of omega-6 fatty acids from corn-fed animals. And a type of wine that has three times the level of polyphenols than any known wine in the world. It's called Cananao. But the real secret, I think, lies more in the way that they organize their society. And one of the most salient elements of the Sardinian society is how they treat older people. You ever notice here in America, social equity seems to peak at about age 24? <laughs> you know, just look at the advertisements. Uh, here in Sardinia, the older you get, the more equity you have, the more wisdom you're celebrated for. Uh, you go into the bars in Sardinia, instead of seeing the Sports Illustrated swimsuit calendar, you see the centenarian of the month calendar. This, as it turns out, is not only good for your aging parents to keep them close to the family, it imparts about four to six years of extra life expectancy. Research shows it's also good for the children of those families who have lower rates of mortality and lower rates of disease. That's called the grandmother effect. We found our second blue zone on the other side of the planet, about 800 miles south of Tokyo on the uh, archipelago of Okinawa. Okinawa is actually 161 small islands. And in the northern part of the main island, uh, this is ground zero for world longevity. Uh, this is a place where the oldest living female population is found. It's a place where people have the longest disability-free life expectancy in the world. They have what we want. They live a long time and tend to die in their sleep very quickly. And often, I can tell you, after sex. <laughs> they live about seven good years longer than the average American, five times as many centenarians as we have in America, one-fifth the rate of colon and breast cancer, big killers here in America, and one-sixth the rate of cardiovascular disease. And the fact that this culture has yielded these numbers suggests strongly they have something to teach us. What do they do? Once again, a plant-based diet full of vegetables with lots of color in them, and they eat about eight times as much tofu as Americans do. More significant than what they eat, it's how they eat it. They have all kinds of little strategies to keep from overeating, which as you know is a big problem here in America. A few of the strategies we observe, they eat off of smaller plates. So they tend to eat fewer calories at every city. Instead of serving family style, where you can sort of mindlessly eat as you're talking, they serve at the counter, put the food away, and then bring it to the table. They also have a 3,000-year-old adage, which I think is the greatest sort of diet suggestion ever invented. It was invented by Confucius. And that uh, diet is known as the Hara Hachi Bu diet. It's simply a little saying these people say before their meal to remind them to stop eating when their stomach is 20% full. It takes about a half hour for that full feeling to go travel from your belly to your brain. And by remembering to stop at 80%, it helps keep you from doing that very thing. But like Sardinia, Okinawa has a few social constructs that we can associate with longevity. We know that isolation kills. 15 years ago, the average American had three good friends. We're down to one and a half right now. If you were lucky enough to be born in Okinawa, 
You were born into a system where you automatically have a half a dozen friends with whom you travel through life. Uh, they call it a moai. And if you're in a moai, you're expected to share the bounty if you, uh, if you encounter luck. And if things go bad, a child gets sick, a parent dies, you always have somebody who has your back. This particular moai, these five ladies have been together for 97 years. Their average age is 102. Typically in America, we've divided our adult life up into two uh, sections. There's our work life, where we're productive, and then one day, boom, we retire. And typically that is meant um, retiring to the easy chair or going down to Arizona to, to play golf. Uh, in the Okinawan language, there's not even a word for retirement. Instead, there's one word that imbues your entire life, and that word is ikigai. And roughly translated, it means the reason for which you wake up in the morning. And for this 102-year-old karate master, his ikigai was carrying forth this martial art. For this 100-year-old fisherman, it was continuing to catch fish for his family three times a week. And this is a question, the National Institute on Aging actually gave us a questionnaire to give these centenarians. And one of the questions, they were very culturally astute, uh, people put the questionnaire. One of the questions was, what is your ikigai? And they instantly knew why they woke up in the morning. For this 102 year old woman, her ikigai uh, was simply her great, great, great granddaughter. Uh, two girls separated in age by 101 and a half years. And, and I asked her what it felt like uh, to hold a great, great, great granddaughter. And she put her head back and she said, it feels like leaping into heaven. I thought that was a wonderful thought. My editor at Geographic wanted me to find America's Blue Zone. And for a while, we looked on the prairies of Minnesota, where actually there's a very high proportion of centenarians, but that's because all the young people left. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we turned to the data again, and we found America's longest lived population among the Seventh-day Adventists concentrated in and around Loma Linda, California. Adventists are conservative Methodists, they celebrate their uh, Sabbath from sunset on Friday till sunset on Saturday, uh, tw a 24-hour sanctuary in time, they call it. And they follow five little habits that convey to them extraordinary longevity, comparatively speaking. In America here, life expectancy for the average woman is 80, but for an Adventist woman, their life expectancy is 89, and the difference is even more pronounced among men who are expected to live about 11 years longer than their American counterparts. Now this is a study that followed about 70,000 people for 30 years, a sterling study, and I think it supremely illustrates the premise of this Blue Zone project. This is a heterogeneous community. It's white, black, Hispanic, Asian. The only thing they have in common are a set of very small lifestyle habits that they follow ritualistically for most of their lives. They take their diet directly from the Bible, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where God talks about legumes and seeds, and on one more stanza about uh, green plants, ostensibly missing his meat. They take this sanctuary in time very serious. For 24 hours every week, no matter how busy they are, how stressed out they are at work, where the kids need to be driven, they stop everything and they focus on their God, their social network, and then hardwired right in the religion are nature walks. And the power of this is not that it's done occasionally, the power is it's done every week for a lifetime. None of it's hard, none of it costs money. Adventists also tend to hang out with other Adventists. So if you go to an Adventist party, you don't see people swilling Jim Beam or rolling a joint. Instead, they're talking about uh, their next nature walk, exchanging recipes, and yes, uh, they pray. But they influence each other in profound and measurable ways. This is a culture that has yielded Ellsworth Wareham. Ellsworth Wareham is 97 years old. He's a multimillionaire. Yet when a contractor wanted $6,000 to build a privacy fence, he said, for that kind of money, I'll do it myself. So for the next three days, he was out shoveling cement and hauling poles around. And predictably, perhaps, on the fourth day, he ended up in the operating room. But not as the guy on the table, the guy 
uh, doing open heart surgery. At 97, he still does 20 open heart surgeries every month. Ed Rawlings, 103 years old now, an active cowboy, starts his morning with the swim, and on the weekends he likes to put on the boards, throw up <laughs> rooster tails. And then Marge Deton. Uh, Marge is 104. Her grandson actually lives in the Twin Cities here. She starts her day with lifting weights. She rides her bicycle. And then she gets in a root beer colored 1994 Cadillac Seville and tears down the San Bernardino Freeway where she still volunteers for seven different organizations. I've been on 19 hardcore expeditions. I'm probably the only person you'll ever meet who rode his bicycle across the Sahara Desert without sunscreen. Uh, but I'll tell you, there was no adventure more harrowing than riding shotgun <laughs> with Marge Jaton. A stranger is a friend I haven't met yet, she'd say to me. So what are the common denominators in these, in these three cultures? What are the things that they all do? And we managed to boil it down to nine. In fact, we've done two more Blue Zone expeditions since this, uh, and th these common denominators hold true. And the first one, and I'm about to utter a heresy here, none of them exercise at least the way we think of exercise. Instead, they set up their lives so that they're constantly nudged into physical activity. These 100-year-old Okinawan women are getting up and down off the ground. They sit on the floor 30 or 40 times a day. Uh, the Sardinians live in vertical houses, up and down the stairs. Every trip to the store or to church or to the friend's house occasions a walk. They don't have any conveniences. There's not a button to push to do yard work or housework. If they want to mix up a cake, they're doing it by hand. That's physical activity. That burns calories just as much as going on the treadmill does. When they do do intentional physical activity, it's things they enjoy. They tend to walk, the only proven way to stave off cognitive decline, and they all tend to have a garden. They know how to set up their life in the right way so they have the right outlook. Each of these cultures take time to downshift. The Sardinians pray, the Seventh-day Adventists pray, the Okinawans have this ancestor veneration. But when you're in a hurry or stressed out, that triggers something called the inflammatory response, which is associated with everything from Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease to cardiovascular disease. When you slow down for 15 minutes a day, you turn that inflammatory state into a more anti-inflammatory state. They have vocabulary for sense of purpose. Ikigai, like the Okinawans. You know, the two most dangerous years in your life are the year you're born because of infant mortality and the year you retire. These people know their sense of purpose and they activate in their life. That's worth about seven years of extra life expectancy. There's no longevity diet. Instead, these people drink a little bit every day, not a hard sell to the American population. <laughs> they tend to eat a plant-based diet. Doesn't mean they don't eat meat, but lots of beans and nuts and they have strategies to keep from overeating, little things that nudge them uh, away from the table at the right time. And then the foundation of all this is how they connect. They put their families first, take care of their children and their aging parents. Uh, they all tend to belong to a faith-based community, which is worth between four and 14 extra years of life expectancy if you do it four times a month. And the biggest thing here is they also belong to the right tribe. They were either born into or they proactively surrounded themselves with the right people. We know from the Framingham studies that if your three best friends are obese, there's a 50% better chance that you'll be overweight. So if you hang out with unhealthy people, that's gonna have a measurable impact over time. Instead, if, you're, if your friend's idea of, of recreation is physical activity, bowling or playing hockey or biking or gardening, if your friends drink a little but not too much and they eat right and they're engaged and they're trusting and trustworthy, that is gonna have the biggest impact over time. Diets don't work. No diet in the history of the world has ever worked for more than 2% of the population. Exercise programs usually start in January, they're usually done by October. When it comes to longevity, there is no short-term fix in a pill or anything else. But when you think about, about it, your friends, are long-term adventures, and therefore, perhaps the most significant thing you can do to add more years to your life and life to your years. Thank you very much. Please turn to the person sitting next to you right in front of you.
with you and share with them some ways you could use this in your classroom and how you think this would help your children learn about adulthood and aging. Now, of course, I would love to hear your ideas, but um, to be honest with you, because there's so many other things I want to share with you, um, I'm just going to say that I know that going around the room, I heard some really good ideas. <laughs> and as I was watching the, um, the video, the first time I watched it, you know, I'm one of those people that take notes. I take notes on books I read, so I have to take notes on videos. So the things I wrote on the board were the things that I just pulled out the very first time I saw the video that I thought, wow, I could use these things in class. I could talk about your stereotypes of aging. I could talk about the myths that they mentioned and what the kids believed or didn't know were true or false. And I certainly could talk about in the United States, and some of you really keyed in on this, our diet, the geography, the equity or lack thereof of equity that we have towards people as they age, exercise or our ideas about it. And the social constructs that we have I mean, that's a topic that would really be interesting. You know how they mention friendship, the BFFs, for 101 years? Right. Yes. Great articles now and research coming out on what kids think BFFs are, you know, best friends forever, and how their concept of friendship related to things like social networking sites is very different than the real circle of real people that you come in contact with and the effects on health, and the effects on your mental states, as well as physical, there's a big difference. And so you can bring that into the discussion as well. Now, don't forget that it actually is a wonderful thing for individuals that are aging as they get older. Um, they're on Facebook, and they are in contact with people that they would not be able to be in contact with because of their physical health. And it's a wonderful thing, it's positive. But we have to look at both the positive and negative of how we view friendship and how we actually interact with our friends. And there is a difference between the physical and the networking type of friendship. So that could be a discussion back when we taught adolescents, and it could continue here to see the differences between the, the tight friendship groups and the results of this study. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, kind of rhetorical. Is there any society in the world that has a more negative view towards aging, the aging process, and the elderly the United States does? I don't know. Just throwing and I it out really, there. I, I mean, I'm not sure I could even answer that question, but it's a good question to throw out sense. there to think about in reference to how do we view aging and how do you think we should view aging. And personally, when I get done with my unit on aging, I want my children to have a little bit of a different point of view. I would like it to be more on the positive end than what they came in with. Because some have a great view of aging because they have grandparents that are active. I'm going to say this even though it's going to kill me. They're my age. Um, I could have kids, of, you know, I could have grandkids. But, you know, they're active, they're healthy. And then there's other children that have grandparents that are not active and healthy. So, you know, there's all these different views about when you get to be 60, 70, and 80, how you're going to interact. So I think the more we bring in a positive attitude about aging, the better both for the students and also for their relationships with those individuals in their lives. This lesson is also a, an opportunity if you are the sociology teacher or you work with the sociology teacher, if you both hit this topic um, and make the connections at, from looking at a personal level to looking at a uh, a group, a broader group level. There are a lot of connections. And when well. you study social institutions and sociology, um, you can definitely bring in um, these links to, the, to look at how we we house individuals as they age, and you know the other things that all relate to the aging process that some of us have had a lot of experience with, both positive and negative. So anyway, there's a lot you can do with it, right? Another study. Um, this is an awesome research center. So for history, as well as psych, so I mean, this you want to go to, it's PW, the Pew Research Center. They happen to have a lot of different studies. And this 
particular survey on aging, which I found, among a nationally representative sample of 2,969 adults, shows that there's a big gap, a big gap between the expectations of young adults and middle-aged adults about old age. There's a big gap between what your students think when they're high school students, college students, young adults, and then our age, your age, all right? So what are those gaps? So this is another excellent place to go for information that you can use in your classroom. Um, and there's a lot of different studies in here that um, you can use. So you just go to the data bank and you'll find out where the top stories are. You'll find out um, the latest downloads and the latest studies that relate to all different topics that you can use in your class. Here's the topic index. Um, so you can see there's um, all different topics that relate, again, to history classes. So some of you who are teaching history, you know, you can look at in the research on politics, energy, the environment, global attitudes, foreign affairs, um, internet, technology, and that's great for sociology, by the way. Um, and also, you know, public opinions, there's stuff on religion that could relate, relate directly to what you were just saying about the study that we just looked at. Research methodology. Um, so you can use that in your research section, and that is part of your class. And of course, social trends. So I mean, look through this and find ways that you can utilize it. Once again, it's a great resource for research. So you could use it in a number of different places in your classroom. Um, Growing Old in America is the one that I would suggest you look at in reference to this topic specifically. Okay? It talks about memory loss. Inability to drive, the end of sexual activity, struggle with loneliness, depression, difficulty paying bills. Um, issues that the children should be aware of. Issues that adults are dealing with. And, and issues that help them understand better the benchmarks that are associated with aging. Both positive and negative. There's a lot of positive things. We don't want to just teach the negative. Okay? So they look at both positive and negative. In fact, here's some of the results. Real quick. Okay? Older adults report experiencing certain things at different levels than youngsters, okay? Older adults report experiencing fewer of the benefits of aging than the younger adults thought they would get. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to retire, I'm going to move to the islands, you know, yeah. Yeah, right. The benefits of aging. Um, as you grow older, things become different in your mind as far as expectations. There's also a different expectancy about when you spend time with your family, traveling, pleasure, hobbies, volunteer work, second careers. So it's interesting to look at how the children think about it in your classroom and they compare it to what they found out in the research. Generation gaps that extend to what we consider some of the most basic questions about aging. 18 to 29 year olds believe that the average person is old at age 60. So I have two more years and I'm old. Okay? Middle-aged respondents put the threshold close to 70. So that's cool. I got 12 more years. I like that. Respondents ages 65 and above say that the average person does not become old until turning 74. So that gives me a couple more years. Who in here is over 74? Please tell me your response. When do you become old? I would say about 80. <laughs> yeah. adults have, individuals have, and of course as you grow older your mind thinks differently. So I, I just think these potential markers need to be discussed with your kids and also need to be put in the, I guess in the reality of the age group and understand where they're coming from and then let them ask their parents these questions, let them ask their grandparents, let them ask people they know to get the differences in opinions so that they can really see how they're not the only ones and they're not, they don't have the right answer all the time. There's a lot of different answers to the same question which is a great essential question that you have in your lesson, right? When does old age begin? Now, we don't always use the term old age, by the way. In fact, most folks have changed it to later adulthood. And I like that better. I think we also view it the opposite way. When kids are 16, they think they're an adult. Oh, yeah. And so the older you get, the I think that when do they become an adult also gets older. Great so question. We view it the opposite when do they become an adult? Yes. Yeah. And actually, you could ask them, do you remember when you were five and you thought your mother was old? And she was 20. <laughs> no, you know, 25. So, yeah, that, that's a great perspective there. You really have to look at how you can change that question around and relate it to your kids. There are a handful of potential markers.
markers that we do have to be realistic about failing health, ability to live independently, inability to drive. At your age, good health is pretty much a thing of the past. My advice is find an illness you enjoy. <laughs> but that's just a funny question that I found. Okay? But we do have to understand some of these indicators and try to figure out how to work with them. So maybe if we give our students some ideas at their early age, if they become adults, maybe they'll think about it differently. Maybe they'll understand their parents better as they age. Maybe they'll understand their grandparents better. I mean, there's a lot of things they can gain from understanding how aging occurs, right? And these are the response. These are some of the responses from the research. <laughs> yes. Good question. Uh, I was just thinking of something in the Myers textbook that I um, remember not. It said that um, elderly people are uh, less likely to get like regular sicknesses. Yeah. And it's, it's, I don't know if that's fair. It didn't make sense. No, it's true. Like, from what I understand, they don't get the common cold as much. They don't, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, new systems have, you know, really the things that it's still fast. I guess that, like, the bigger things are like, harder to deal with. Absolutely. From personal experience, you have a cold that you get every year yeah. as you're teaching. Yeah. For me, it was pneumonia in January, yeah. inevitably. First things have kind of backed away. I've got my big illnesses, you know, my type 2 diabetes, and my other things that I deal with on a long-term basis, but I don't get the little stuff so much. Yeah, you know when you're a new teacher, you're sick yeah. before yeah. Christmas? Oh, yeah. Remember? Yes. Being a new teacher and you were dying by Christmas, like you yeah. couldn't yeah. breathe, yeah. Yeah. and you were scared to take off the yeah. school because you were a new teacher and you went to school and you yeah. couldn't breathe. By the time you're like teaching about 10 years, you don't have to get it. You become immune to the kids. <laughs> totally immune to their illnesses. Yes, and the big, you know, I'm serious. It really, can you, how many people have experienced this over the years? <laughs> You're healthier than those 24 year olds that come in, right? Yes and no. There's, <laughs> yes and no. I don't get the cold. But, they can, they come in. They've been thrown up for four days. They right. get cold. I'm fine. What I get now is the lifestyle stuff. I, get, I don't drink enough water, so I get a kidney stone. Exactly. Or I, or exactly. I don't get enough exercise, so my back goes out. I mean, it's, it's, and that's the it's, aging yeah. process. Yes. Okay? So, there's a big question I'd like you to leave with. Um, one other thing I want you to do. I really think that this would be a good question to focus lessons on. Right. One of the many. Um, there's a great um, bit of research now on the millennials, and of course we want to make sure our students understand themselves, so just to make a couple other suggestions, you might want to look at this research um, that talks about demographics in the society, um, that talks about the millennial culture and how they have high expectations, diversity and thought, and they're very technologically immersed. Gee, we didn't know that. <laughs> Um, connected to their cell phones so that you know they're walking into fountains in the mall and things like that. But anyway, this allows us to help them better understand themselves and the young adults, if you're teaching you know, 18 year olds through 25 year olds, the diversity of their group compared to adults, the differences in the ethnicity. This is 2009, so of course it'd be great to update the stats in another year or two, but it's really hard to get stats for 2012 that are, you know, newer than 2010 or 11, because usually it takes a year or two to really get the stats published. So I don't mind using stats that are two or three years old in my classroom, but then you try to update them if you can. Um, differences in priorities, something you can talk about in your classroom when you're discussing aging and how your priorities and the kids' priorities change over their lifespan. Interesting, right? Differences, you know, in overall attitude, are you more or less confident? This is a great discussion topic for, you know, that stability versus change issue in development. Um, are you as confident, more confident, or less confident? Are you more connected, less connected, whatever? Are you open to change? As you get older, how many of you really think that you become more open to change? Raise your hand. I have really become more open to change. Now, you can discuss a lot of things, you can take that a lot of ways, you can write journal entries about that, um, you can have small group discussions, but it's certainly a topic I think you might want to address in response to aging. And I really think that this is my goal. If I was going to have a goal for my unit, my unit on aging, this is my goal. 
And I would look at my essential questions based on that goal and enduring understandings and objectives for my lessons and I would plan from there. So I would like, that's my end goal for my students and my class. And I really think it's important to teach about aging and, and um, later adulthood because of that. Okay, standards, areas. Um, I'll put this on the wiki. Please note once again that when we're talking about these performance indicators, if you were working on this particular area and you have some ideas, please give them to me, give them to Caitlin, put them on the, the link online to, up, to upload them because we really need performance indicators for all the standards. So these are just ones I wrote, just came up with these because I thought they related to my lessons and I thought that maybe these were pretty good. And they relate to the performance standards, 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3. Okay? So that's that. Um, I know that we're almost done here, but there were a couple other things I wanted to point out. I actually um, would love for you to take a little survey that I think would be interesting <coughs> to use in your class if you're teaching about aging. Um, and I don't know if Mike, you want to share anything specific with them, but um, what I'll do is, while you're, if you want to talk, I do have two hard copies of what I was showing you, you could download. These are the ones, you know, two samples of the newsletters that I use with my kids in the cooperative land learning group. And then, um, in reference to death and dying, I use this, I got this from my textbook that I use in my college class. It's a developmental psychology class. It's lifespan development. And I give them this death anxiety questionnaire and we discuss it um, before we talk about death and dying in that particular class. So um, it's from my textbook and it's from Pearson, um, from the teacher's textbook guide. And it's just a little 15 question questionnaire that you might want to take. And then on the back, you know, it's a self-scoring thing. So I'll pass that out for you. And of course you can use it with your students as well. Okay? So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes. I have a couple of things in the same domain. Uh, developing domain, developing and learning domain. And uh, I know one theme that came up a little bit uh, in this conversations, and uh, Peter and maybe one other person made a comment about how quickly we have to move in our classes and so on. And we're all on different schedules and like. So we'll try to keep some of those, take some of those things into account. Again, I have handouts for these things. One thing, I thought it might have two values for you. One, you might want to do something like this. The other is even if you don't want to do it with your students, that it might be an interesting reference for you from my class or any one of us could do this. I do little graphic organizers. I just call test prep sheets. You've seen a million graphic organizer things. I've been doing this for a long time. I originally did it four months up when I was first starting to teach you. I'd be writing a test, and I wanted to be able to know conceptually what I had done and not test things that I hadn't actually done. Because I think a lot of tests like that, I remember you would do. Oh, just do the last part. You can figure it out. Uh, so I wanted to avoid that trap. And then early on, I thought, I'm just going to give it to the kids, too. And uh, I usually color code them. So this is the learning theory one for what it's worth. And uh, you know, this one would be pink, and another one's orange, and so on. And especially in a class, any class where you're going to give a, a cumulative assessment at the end, any type of cumulative assessment, but I know for an advanced placement class, we have a big test at the end. This can be great. They have 13, 14 of these at the end. Could be useful, even if you don't want to use it for your kids. It might be interesting to check, not check yourself, because this isn't to, to be all and end all by any means. But for us to, to talk about, I don't actually do that, or what, what do you do with that, or does that work for me? So, so that's one thing I'll give to you. Another that kind of fits uh, with what uh, Deb was doing but overall with uh, stage theories in general. Once you've had the introductory discussion about continuity versus discontinuity theories and so on, and you're going to do stage theories, I have a little packet here of several things that I do to get at uh, stage theories. One of them is Erickson's psychosocial stages of life. So there are two things that I have on that. One is I find that really interesting, but maybe because we like to teach uh, And I'm not sure if the kids will. Also, they try to memorize it, and that's very hard. I think it's hard. 
so one thing I think, and you probably do this intuitively in so many ways, and I kind of intuited my way through it for a long time until I started to do it systematically, was to ask them to predict them before. Mm -hmm. What do you think most 20 to 20 to 30 year olds, what's the big thing people are deciding when or wrestling with? And often, not old, but often they'll really reason out Erickson's stage theory on their own. And then it's just a matter of plugging in the gaps and giving terminology. Now I'm sure we all do that a lot. You do a lot of drawing from what they know and you reason out and then say, and then it's beautiful when you say, yeah, that's actually, and that's called this, and it was supported by this research, and then they've actually constructed their knowledge rather than just uh, you disseminating the knowledge. So I'm sure you've done things like this, but I have a little form for the way I ask those questions. Uh, and usually we, as many of you do, we have a million strategies for this, have them write for a moment on it, get in a dyad or a triad, compare, share. I have found, I've certainly over half the time, you get the stages in one little segment. You've done Erickson's stage theories. And so then simultaneously you can follow up with stage theories in general. So it, because Erickson's stage theory isn't a discontinuity theory as much as some others are. So I have a little handout in there where I just made a little, got it, a little uh, a review of several stage theories, PIJ and so on. And then foreshadowing some that might come later in the class. Freudian psychosexual state, very problematic perhaps. Uh, others. Uh, more Kohlberg on more reasoning. Uh, also rich for critical thinking. Uh, and asking uh, them to rate it on a scale. Is it truly discontinuous? Is it stage-like or is this more little continuity breaks? And then a oh, break. Is it universal? Is it universal across cultures? Is it universal uh, in terms of sex differences and so on? And uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, is, it, is it universal? Is it uh, discontinuous? And then I have one. Is it hierarchical? Sorry. Uh, that is, once you've moved up the ladder, do you ever go back? Uh, and that's where even the state alleged, uh, not alleged, but uh, Cooper Ross on death and dying. Everyone says nobody really, she didn't represent it as a true stage theory. And certainly, I don't know about you and my community, I like that anger one. I, you know, <laughs> then with the anger, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but those, those questions, they just invite the question of continuity versus discontinuity. Last thing is I uh, do use mnemonics a lot in my class, and how many of you do know, and uh, I, this isn't just kind of a rhetorical question, I actually want to kind of get a sense of it. How many of you know or use the peg word mnemonic? Okay, good. I think it's good to teach it because it's fun, but it's not just fun. And we usually do a shopping list, and, and kids, I, I've done it sometimes just quickly, with freshmen, at the end of the year, I'll go into freshman history classes and just do some site stuff. And we'll do pegboard and monitor with shopping list. And then three years later, I have them in site. And we do memory. And we'll talk about the mnemonic devices. I'm not making this up. I'm sure you've had experiences like this, too. And say, pegboard mnemonic. And the kid is sitting in the back, they're like, I remember the shopping list from freshman year. And, mm -hmm. and they do. Uh, and they haven't thought about it again. Now, that's relatively mindless and, and very concrete and relatively mindless, not relevant. But I think you can use the peg word mnemonic to uh, remember the Erickson, Erickson stage. So I use the peg word mnemonic. I usually walk them through the mnemonic, the imagery. One is a bun in the peg word mnemonic. You picture a little child, maybe you as a child or your little brother for something when they were a baby. One is a bun. Picture a one-year-old sitting in a high chair about to eat in the hamburger bun. Uh, and uh, they start to cry, and someone pats them on the head and says, it's OK, it's all right. You can basically trust eating that, trust versus mistrust. Two, ver two three, and four, which overlap quite a bit. Industry, kids always have trouble with that. Industry versus superiority, autonomy, shame, and not, not they all the same in many ways they are. But you can use imagery too as a shoe, a child, we've all seen this, if you know anything about little kids who wants to put the shoe on. But 
can't tie their shoes, but won't let you tie their shoes. <laughs> and like, yeah, but we'd like to leave today, so let me just do those for you. But they were, no, I'll do it myself, except you're not actually able to do that yet. And you can do a picture. I'd walk you through the whole thing, but I actually wrote it on there. And then later, when you circle back to it, it's pretty quick. They constructed their knowledge of the stage theory originally anyway. So it is, it, it is understanding. It's simply a way to retrieve what you understand. And retrieve it six months later, if you need it. And when, the first time I did this, it was because I was teaching it a long time ago. And I could, two, three, and four especially, I couldn't keep straight. Have you had that problem? No. Uh, so I was like, well, I can't screw this up, really. If they say, what's the difference between two and three? I'm like, frankly, I do not know. <laughs> I know it's my job, but I'm not doing it. So I wanted to get it right. I used it, and then I thought, well, it's going to this, and they claimed that it's good. So I have handouts for all of these. And if you don't mind sitting for another minute while Craig talks, I'll pass it on.